Well, hey, good morning again. Good to see you all. I want to welcome uh, everyone who's visiting, as well as the folks online on the stream at Pajama Church. Welcome to this beautiful Sunday morning. It's okay, my family's on Pajama Church right now. Good morning, Mrs. Horton. Good morning, Arrow. So last week, uh, Pastor Donald kicked off our sermon series in Nehemiah with a uh, sermon titled, Prayer to God Moves the Heart of Kings and Ordinary Men. And in case you missed it, the book of Nehemiah opens with its main character, Nehemiah, getting some pretty bummer news about the place of his heritage and the people of his heritage, uh, Jerusalem, being in ruins. And for a little bit of context, Jerusalem was in ruins because God had sent the people of Israel away from Jerusalem because of their sin. He had put them into captivity under the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonian Empire was then conquered by the Persian Empire. And uh, there we find Nehemiah. Nehemiah was born into exile, and God, at just the right time, chose to use him as an instrument and to make a pretty big ask to the king, which we had talked about last week. Um, the ask was to help make the capital city of Jerusalem defensible again, and he asked him to give him provisions to build a wall around the city. And in a miracle moment, the king agrees. Uh, and now to avoid giving you any more of the story shorthand, I uh, will start reading in Nehemiah uh, chapter 2, verse 7. Uh, I'm reading from the ESV. If you have other translations, you can feel free to follow along. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governor's of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the, king of the, ke the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress and the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for, uh, granted me what I asked for the good hand of my God was upon me. The good hand of my God was upon me. And then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now, the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen, but when Sambalot the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Jerusalem, and I was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one, I told no one, what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me, but the one on which I rode. And I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate. I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. And then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. So let's take a quick pause here to look at some pictures. I'm in kind of a Dr. Seuss picture book time in my life, and uh, maybe you're here as an Old Testament scholar, uh, and you know about all of these uh, gates and where they're at, um, but I was not aware at all until uh, I had taken a look at some of the, the images that are available there. Um, Nehemiah's Luke starts in the lower portion out of the valley gate, and he kind of makes this southward loop, and you can see the fountain gate and the king's garden, and he comes back up by the uh, Gihon Spring there, and makes his loop back in through the valley gate. So the first thing to notice about this wall that was to be built is that it's somewhere around 1,200 yards long, uh, and that's each direction, and then at its widest point, it's just over uh, 300 yards. And uh, I know we're reading the Bible, so we should probably use something other than an imperial yard to measure that, but that's what we speak. Um, I, I saw a snippet of conversation online one time uh, where someone said, 
uh, a blue whale is larger than a basketball court, to which someone replied, Americans will use anything but the metric system. Uh, to which an American replied, come within three whales of America and say that. So <laughs> anyway, it wasn't by modern standards uh, a ton of space, but we're talking about an area of around 86 to 90 acres that needed to be protected by this wall. And for scale, my neighborhood in North Toledo is around 1,030 acres, which I mean, actually makes Winnie the Pooh's neighborhood look kind of small. But the second thing to notice uh, is that the wall that they were building wasn't something like a residential wall. So this is something that you might see along River Road. Uh, and I think it would be effective for keeping individual intruders out, maybe keep someone from stealing your catalytic converter. Uh, but the wall they were needing to build was the type of wall that would completely defend their city from a foreign army, like a, a huge attack. And their wall that they uh, built is probably similar to what is there in modern day Jerusalem around the old city. Um, this wall is not a small wall, okay? Um, it, is, uh, it was built in the 16th century by the Ottoman Empire, and it's not the, the same wall, but they built over the space where Nehemiah's wall had been uh, previously. And so without this defensive structure around the city, it, it wasn't just they were worried about a whole nation coming against them, uh, which they had context for, but other neighboring peoples could send just small raiding bands in to carry off their livestock, to carry off their children. Uh, they had no hope without some kind of way to defend themselves. And, you know, th while this isn't the exact wall, uh, I wanted to frame the idea for you that if people who are living now in generations of poverty were going to build a wall, this was going to require every who in Whoville, you know, being on the same page. Um, and that brings me to my first point, which is discretion will guard you or sorry, discretion will watch over you, understanding will guard you. And if that sounds familiar, that's because I stole it straight out of Proverbs 2.11. Uh, notice how Nehemiah does not go around running his mouth before he takes the time to understand the problem. And I think that it's possible he could have stored a, uh, stirred up a lot of social clout for himself uh, when he first rolled into Jerusalem, he's got the king's soldiers with him, and he could have said, like, look here, I'm going to build a wall, and I'm going to make Assyria pay for it. Uh, but he didn't, and that might have sounded really good in his head, but how would his enemies have taken that? How would the king's officials have taken that? How would that have affected uh, the social uh, unrest that was already going on within the people of Israel? So, what I mean to say here is if God puts something on your heart, you don't have to go telling everybody about it right away, okay? You don't have to post about it on Facebook. In fact, if that's your first step of action, then I would ask you to ask yourself, why am I really doing this? Who am I really doing this for? Because just, just because God has his hand on you for good does not mean that it's somehow impossible for you to mess it up. And God knows the secrets of your heart. Uh, and if he's moving you, just, just practice uh, discretion. There's a, a fun little vocabulary word that I learned, it's taciturn. Uh, the truth will come out in time, okay? Uh, but as the indie music artist, Me Without You, sang, we've got a heck of a lot to learn about remaining taciturn. And uh, point number two is whoever knows the right thing to do, and fails to do it for him, it is sin. That's out of James 4, 17. When the hand of God is upon you for good, get moving, right? So Nehemiah practices discretion, and then he hits the road. And I don't want to be misunderstood here. I'm not saying there's never a time to wait on the Lord, right? Pastor Donald mentioned this last week that uh, when Nehemiah uh, first heard the, the news, it was in the month of Nisan, I think, uh, and it wasn't until the month of Kislev that he was before the king. And I don't know the Persian calendar, but that's not the same month, and there's some period of time in between those. Um, but he did, he, he did wait on the Lord. Right? That, that's important that we take that time for ourselves. 
But once he had God's favor on him and he recognized that, he got directly to action. He didn't wait for somebody else to do something about it. He didn't wait to bring a friend along. He didn't just like donate to the Jerusalem wall, go fund me, God bless you guys, prayer emoji. He takes the reins in a very literal sense and begins answering the prayer that God had empowered him to. He took the first step of obedience and an illustration from my life for that um, was from a hot, hot summer night in 2014. I was working third shift in men's ministry at Cherry Street Mission. Uh, and at the time, housing for men's ministry was somewhere around 250 people. I think we could actually do like 249, and that was the cap. And that night, we were sleeping over 300 people in men's ministry. So when we ran out of beds, we started putting people on cots. And when we ran out of cots, we started putting people on floor. Uh, and the floor, people were like shoulder to shoulder lined up, even through the office space. Uh, and every bit of space was sucked up in there. And uh, as the night went on, uh, by some kind of mistake, uh, I made this, <laughs> this horrible discovery. And that was that toilet paper had not been delivered to the men's building that week. And we were out. Like every floor, every stall, we were out of toilet paper. And uh, the maintenance team wasn't going to be in until 9 a.m. And wake up call was at 6 a.m. And I was just struggling to imagine what am I going to do with 300 people and no toilet paper in the morning. So I did uh, what I knew how to do, and that was to pray and ask God for toilet paper. And there was context for this action because... Uh, I had seen how God provided over and over and over again. If, if you ran out of soap, and you don't want to run out of soap at the men's shelter, we would pray, and it would be the most random thing. It could be, you know, one in the morning, and someone's uh, on their way home uh, from their, their trip, and they ring the doorbell and drop off a bag of, of soap that they picked up from the hotels on their journey, and it was always this amazing answer to prayer. If it was socks, or if it was coats, or if it was blankets, and we'd run out of blankets and pray, and blankets show up, there was always some way that God was showing up to make a way in our crisis. So I began to pray, and I began to express my fears about what would happen if God did not come through. <laughs> and as I leaned over my desk praying, I, I heard the voice of God, go buy some toilet paper. <laughs> it didn't sound like that, but it was something like that. And it was like Hagar near the well. God opened my eyes to something that had been there the whole time. God had afforded me a paycheck. God had afforded me a vehicle. God had afforded me a 24-hour Kroger that was open. And so I went and became an instrument in the hand of God in the crisis of my day. So Nehemiah gets moving, and he becomes the instrument in the hand of God in the crisis of his day. So listen to what he says next in verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the trouble that we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. So Nehemiah spills the beans on the plans here, and he begins to strengthen the survivors of the exile. With understanding as his guard, his words become the galvanizing hope for this project. And he takes the next first step of obedience, and he builds the people up. Because you yourselves are like living stones being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. God is interested in building up people, not building up buildings. And I've said this before, and I think it could be worth repeating. Excuse me. But if we lose sight of the centrality of the gospel and the hope as found in Jesus Christ, I think it would be no different to God if we donated this church building to the Mormons because I sense that he's indifferent to which dead religion lives inside this structure. 
This is not the house of the Lord, and it never has been. In 2009, when this church burned down, did God call the Red Cross for a hotel? Did God experience homelessness when the structure burned down? This is the house of God's people. See, we're the ones that need heat and AC and indoor plumbing. God does not need those things. God didn't need a wall around Jerusalem to protect himself. Wasn't it for the people in Jerusalem that God was building a wall? And I wonder if the compassion, the heaviness that came over Nehemiah for a place that he didn't even grow up in was his own, or was this the Spirit of God putting this heaviness on him, shaping Nehemiah so that God's people could return to the place of their possession? If something in our facilities is not to the glorification of God and the edification of his people, then I think it's time for it to go. And if it's just for our boasting and our gratification that we build up a campus around us, then I sense that it becomes an, an idol to us, that we begin practicing idolatry to celebrate the strength and the power that we have, not the one who loved the people. And Nehemiah never asked someone to lift a finger to pick up a brick or do anything else until he first encourages the people. And then the people strengthen themselves to the task. This, friends, is the next first step of obedience to build one another up. Uh, look what the Word of God says here. Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you, uh, lest there be in you, any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day. Exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. And before I read the next section of Scripture, uh, which has to do with those who oppose the Jews from the outside, I want to go over something that concerns me, uh, and that is corrupting talk that comes from the inside. And it doesn't concern me because I believe that this is a problem uh, that is rampant in our church. But from the book of James, uh, it says, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And I feel that in this season for our organization, it is critical that we address the real possibility that we could tear one another apart if we do not guard our tongue. So first, let me say, uh, my name is Jason Horton, if you guys uh, don't know me or, or are new around here, and I am the facilities director for First Alliance Church. Uh, I am a, a part-time paid staff member, and my job here is, is not as a preacher or a teacher, uh, though I am on the teaching team, and maybe quarterly I get the opportunity to present. Um, my primary responsibility is to serve the needs of the staff to help support their work in ministry. Um, I also set up special events like weddings, funerals, uh, things like that. I manage contracts, uh, our insurance, snow removal, janitorial supplies, different rental agreements we have with partners around the property. Um, I provide basic maintenance. I fix a lot of doors, a lot of thermostats. I know some of you call me about that. Um, I oversee the janitorial functions, though I don't primarily clean anymore. I have an awesome high-speed, low-drag team that does... Uh, almost all of the cleaning around here. Um, I work alongside the trustees and the building and planning committee, uh, though technically I'm not sure I'm a member of, of either one of those things. I provide information to them uh, regarding decisions that are ultimately sent to the elders for approval. Uh, property transactions, the buying and selling of property are presented to the elders by the trustee board uh, before they're brought to a congregational vote, and then they're sent to the district executive committee uh, who also gets a vote since really our property isn't owned by this organization. It's owned by the Christian Missionary Alliance, um, not necessarily our local church. Uh, and I'm saying all this because I want to clarify that I am a man under authority who executes the decisions given, uh, given to me, and I am not the decision maker myself. Uh, our boards that make decisions are made up of elected officials within the church who we believe are trustworthy and faithful men and women 
who hear from God and are obedient to the voice of God. Uh, that's why we elect them. Uh, if you have a concern or a disagreement about decisions being made within the church, do not gossip your concerns or worries or frustrations to other people who are not decision makers. When you speak idly to one another and not with the people who have the ability to influence decisions, you corrupt the courage of the congregation and you run the risk of becoming a partner with the devil who is the accuser of the brethren. Uh, from Revelation 12, it says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God, and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their own lives, even unto death. Take a moment to look at our door mantle and see the words inscribed over the top of it, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That is why we enter the sanctuary. It takes great courage to hold your tongue <laughs> in a moment where you're feeling so frustrated. But if you begin to just wonder, I just wonder to other people whether or not your church leadership is making the right decision, then you are subverting them and you are accusing them of failing to hear from God and you're doing it in a way that not only destroys the courage of the person hearing, but it never gives the person making the decision the opportunity to defend themselves or to explain themselves. In Ephesians it says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So I wanna take a, a, just a brief detour, if you'll uh, pardon it, I want to make a note about the Youth Activity Center, uh, and then we'll get right back to the text. Uh, some people have said, though, though not to me, uh, that they're worried that if we tear down the Youth Center and we don't have a plan, we're, we're going to be stuck without it, and we don't have the money to build anything new uh, to replace it. And months ago, I look back and remember, uh, after spending time praying, and, and waiting on God, uh, and, and really doing due diligence, uh, the trustee board and the elder board voted unanimously to tear down the Youth Activity Center. And there is a lot of things that have, have changed and have come up, more information, uh, and, and I'm concerned about it personally. I don't know if I can say that our boards are, I won't speak for them, but for me, uh, the concerns about how much it does cost to build something new, uh, what new thing we even want to build. I don't, you know, we're, we're going through these processes. How much is it going to cost to fix up the spaces that we have? Who's going to manage a new space or partner with a new space with us? Um, and it is dizzying. And I have sat in some of these meetings legitimately feeling like I'm about to pass out from the fear of not knowing what's ahead. And I am afraid. I feel that. But God has not asked us to know the whole plan. He has asked us to take the next first step of obedience. And that is point number four. Our responsibility to God is to take the next step of obedience. And it is also our responsibility to one another. From 1 John uh, 5, 2 through 4, he says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. So if we believed that God inspired us when we made the decision, then we'll continue to have that faith. And if we can believe God when it's beautiful, we can believe God when it is bleak, okay? And if you're struggling or you're confused or you're frustrated with how things are going, I wanna give you a couple actionable steps. And the first one is you can reach out to me. Um, grab me in person, shoot me an email. It's listed on the church website. You're welcome to do that. Um, 
But if you do reach out to me, uh, I want to let you know I've got two expectations for you, okay? I am not a decision-making entity in the church, and so I'm adding these uh, expectations uh, that may not be added if you speak to one of our trustees or elders or whatever. The first one is that you're only going to share the content of our meeting together to the benefit, encouragement, and edification of the congregation, okay? That will be the result of our meeting, is that you have an opportunity to edify other people that you speak with. And the second one is that you're going to come with an opportunity of how can I help? Because I really, I don't have the bandwidth uh, in my part-time position to field a variety of complaints if you're not looking towards providing solutions for them. Um, but I can do my best to empower you and to plug you in to all kinds of volunteer opportunities and to help shape those things. Um, and I, I know that it, I'm making it sound like th this divisive talk is just this huge, huge thing in our church. And I want, please hear me that I am not speaking to anyone specifically. I am speaking broadly and hopefully clearly because this is a huge problem when it becomes one. And the damage is done when the damage happens. And so we're speaking preemptively here, trying to get ahead of it, because we're moving into a season that is very much like the days of Nehemiah when they began working. We have to keep watch over ourselves, okay? We're not responsible for everybody else's actions. You just have to watch yourself. We're a church on a mission. We are striving to live out our mission, vision, and values to the glory and praise of God. And if you have something to bring to the table that is complaint or indifference, then I think the first place that you take that to is to God. Yeah. Lift that up before God in prayer and then come to your church leadership. And the second uh, action step would be to reach out to the chairman of the building and planning committee, Greg Papp. Uh, and I put his contact information there. I know that uh, just before Kirk left, he, he left his uh, information up there. Greg is a good man, and he deserves to be honored in our church community. He's conducted himself with integrity and concern for the future of this organization, and he's also significantly more personable than I am, okay? He's much easier to get along with, uh, and you can also, as I mentioned in the announcements, uh, you can come and join us June 3rd, right? Saturday morning, and put your hand to the work. Uh, because we're going to continue on in the direction that we believe God has called us, and we, we need help. The trustees really need your help uh, joining us, and there's free lunch. It's free lunch. It's okay. Um, when you have questions, you have concerns, you have doubts, don't run your mouth to people who do not make decisions. Okay? We good on that? Feeling pretty okay. All right. Verse 19. <laughs> So when Sambalot, and the Horonite, and Tobiah the Ammonite servant, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper, and we, his servants, will arise and build. We, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. And so point number five is that you set your face towards the one who called you. His response is the God of heaven will make us prosper. From Isaiah 57, it says, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Um, a, a little anecdote about me, I was named after Pastor Jason Spence, he's since passed away, but he was the pastor of Hope Chapel in Kihei, Hawaii, where my parents were married, um, and he studied under Chuck Smith, and some of Chuck Smith's story I think was recently told in a movie, I haven't seen it yet, The Jesus Revolution, and I've been really fascinated about stories from Chuck's life, and uh, one of the ones that I've heard about how the Calvary Chapel movement came to be was chronicled uh, by Ray Ortland of the Gospel Coalition. Uh, he writes this about Chuck. He was pastoring a little church in Costa Mesa, California in the late 1960s, not far from the beach. God began to pour out his spirit. Teenage kids started getting saved and coming to Smith's church. But there was a problem. The oil deposits off the coast of California bubble up little globs of oil that land on the beach, and if you step in one, it sticks to the bottom of your foot and you mess up the carpet when you get home. 
So these young people began coming into church right off the beach, and they didn't know they were supposed to wear shoes. They didn't know church culture. All they knew was Jesus. But the new carpets and pews at Smith's church were getting stained. One Sunday morning, Chuck arrived to church to find a sign posted outside, shirts and shoes, please. He took it down. After the service, he met with the church officers. They talked it through, and they agreed that they would remove the new carpet and pews before they would hinder one kid from coming to Christ. And that wise decision cleared the way for God to visit Calvary Chapel with a wonderful revival. And I was there when they were holding services five nights a week, standing room only. The breakthrough came when they humbled themselves and chose to care about what God cares about and nothing else. When we care about what God cares about, there's no discouragement to get in our way. There's no goofball Tobiah or Sambalot. No, nothing hinders what God is doing inside of us. Nothing was going to stop Chuck from getting the message about the gospel out. Nothing was going to stop Nehemiah from doing what God put on his heart because he set his face like flint and his eyes on the one who had called him. And that feels so nice to say, (laughs) but it requires a rugged commitment and an honest inventory of who we are and what is really important to us. And I regularly need to check myself and ask, do I value our facilities? Or do I value the people that they're intended to disciple? See, Jesus paid for the sin of our enemies. And far be it from me to rob God of what he paid for and become a stench in the nose of people that he loves. Driving them away from Christ. It should never be said about our church, okay? Amen? Amen. Well, we still need to get through chapter 3 today. (laughs) Are you guys ready? (laughs) I I think it would be to your benefit uh, that I don't read all of chapter 3 to you. First, uh, because I want to honor your time. And second, I don't think you want to hear five minutes of me absolutely butchering Jewish names. Okay? Um, So we're going to take a quick recap of what we talked about from chapter 2. Uh, and then I'll give you some chapter 3 homework if, if you want to do chapter 3 homework. Okay, it's optional. You're not graded on it. Um, the first point is discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you. And so we can practice this one together. Uh, let's all turn to our neighbor and say nothing. Don't say anything, okay? Nothing. Good job. Look, you guys passed. All right, great. When the hand of God is upon you for good, get moving. If you've got the favor, don't let it savor, okay? Uh, Point number three, God is interested in building up people, or building up uh, people, not building up buildings. Through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted, but by the mouth of the wicked, it is destroyed, Proverbs 11, 11. Uh, Point number four, our responsibility to God is, is to take the next step of obedience, and we don't need to understand the whole plan, okay? Think of Gideon, right? He, he has an army way too small, and God looks at it and says, nah, sorry, too big. Uh, we just have to obey the part that he's revealed to us. It's like my wife often says to our little toddler, listen and obey, and everything will be okay. Uh, and point number five is that we set the, our face towards the one who called us. Set your face towards the one who called you. I'm saying it to you as much as I say it to myself. uh, God doesn't need you. Just like he doesn't need a church building, just like he doesn't need a city wall, God is in no way experiencing resource scarcity. He didn't save you because he needs more workers. He saved you because he loves you. He saved you because... He loves you, and his nature and his character are not dependent on you. He is totally self-sufficient in his holiness, and there was a time when I was really struggling in ministry at True North, and I had a a group of of trusted mentors around me, uh, one of them being Savannah Martin from the Pregnancy Center, and I remember she laid her hand on my shoulder, and she said, Jason, God did not bring you here to kill you. 
And I'll never forget that. It inspired so much hope in me to remember that. 2 Corinthians 4.1 says, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. And the truth that it's solely because of God's delight and desire that he calls you into participation in the body does so much to stave off the feeling that God in some way afflicts us with ministry. And there are moments we experience great conflict, and we're going to see a whole lot of that throughout Nehemiah. Uh, But in those times, we can set our face back to the Father, back to the one who loves us, back to Jesus who died for us. And we take courage that we are loved and we are held by the one who delights in salvation. See, our, our enemy can destroy, and he can do that, but only God can rescue and only God can save And so we have that he delights in salvation. So we're going to look at one more resource uh, that I'll leave you with, um, something to think about for chapter 3. So chapter 3 is Nehemiah describing each person in Jerusalem, where they lived, and what they built. The map on the screen, uh, which, well, that comes out pretty good there. I can't see. It's much smaller in the back. The map on the screen uh, shows each one of those uh, places in each one of those portions where people were in charge of building up the wall. Um, some were working on very challenging terrain. Um, you can Google Maps Jerusalem and see this little section of the old city. Uh, some of them were working on very flat terrain. Some people uh, contributed to very large wall sections, uh, while other people only had very small sections uh, of the wall. And there are uh, notable people in verse 5 who felt that they were too good to participate in the work. There's a scene in verse 12 where a father is working alongside his daughters, and it feels a little bit like a disservice to just fly over this and not dedicate a whole Sunday uh, to chapter 3, um, because there are so many amazing life application and leadership points that you can discover. Uh, so I want to empower you to do that on your own, so that those who do not want to do that do not have to do that. Um, When you're reading this chapter, something that uh, stuck out to me that you can kind of dwell on as you read each portion, and I'm going to call the the worship team uh, back up at this time. These people are mentioned in this tiny little snippet of Scripture, and some of them are mentioned again in Ezra, some of them are mentioned again later in the book, but most of them, this is a tiny little cameo, just a little tiny slip, a single sentence in the Word of God, and what I've been asking myself is that if I were going to show up in the Word of God, what would that sentence read for me? Uh, I have a, a favorite saying that goes, nobody rises to the occasion, you fall to your highest level of discipline. And um, after you've determined what you would like said about you, put yourself in the scenario, right? How would you like that little snippet to be recorded, I, I want to, you to ask yourself, what if it was going to be written down today? Is what I want to be said the same as the character that I actually present today? Because I highly doubt that any of these folks that were building the wall uh, were actually thinking that, like, oh, this is going to be inscribed in the eternal word of God forever right? (laughs) This is like a candid photo where like you haven't done your makeup yet and you just look and someone takes a snap. You know, is the person you are today similar or the same as the person that you would like to have uh, recorded in scripture? Are, Are you even headed in the direction of what you would like to be said about you? Um, those are some guiding thoughts for your study, should you choose to undertake it. Uh, Read that word, chapter three, it's not super long. Have that conversation with God. Uh, We're gonna kick off that time of reflection uh, with the song that Lucas selected for us, uh, and then I will come back to uh, benedict you and see you on your way.